we had this idea that we were going to start a new band, that we were going to start this band, Crushed Kid, yep. who were going to be like us at, at kind of 17 again. <laughs> And then we were going to do support slots and kind right. of like tiny little gigs and, and, and yeah, Battle of the Bands and stuff like that. Were you going to disguise yourself and wear tracksuits and, yeah? We, I think we went into all that idea of kind of like having kind of um, uh, sort of nom de plumes. And yeah. yeah. Sort of, and and yeah, yeah, it's, it's uniforms and stuff. People are talking about this as Suede's punk album. Tell me about the decision to make an album like that. Yeah, well, first of all, I'd say that it isn't a punk album. It's our punk album, and that's quite an important distinction. It's not supposed to be... We're not kind of aping a genre. Um, I don't think there's, we have any interest in doing that. It's a kind of punk sensibility through a suede lens. So mm -hmm. it's still very much a suede record. There's still the kind of dynamics and the... I don't know. The, the, the kind of... It, it has a different kind of feel to, to a punk record. But it's using lots of those, those influences, using that spirit, that kind of... Um, sort of uh, sense of kind of abandon and carefree and noise and you know energy all these sorts of things and all the rough edges left in I think it was just a desire to you know every record is a reaction to your last one and we'd made two kind of increasingly odd sort of spectral left field records and I didn't really want to go further down that path mm -hmm. and I think it's just there's sometimes there's a real joy to going back to the simplicity of it, what it is to be, to be in a rock band, you know. And how do you create that energy in the studio and in rehearsals of of being more like a like a live band, like a like a new band, I guess. You just you just have to do it with no with no click tracks, with no other musicians, with no kind of second takes. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's lots of mistakes on the record, and there's lots of I mean, it speeds up and it slows down, all those kind of things. But um, you just have to trust to it a, a little bit. You know, it's. Every time we do a record, we, we, we start touring it, and after a few gigs, we're like, that's how it should have sounded. You right. Know what I mean? So it, the idea was to try and get that kind of sense of danger in there right from the start. We were originally going to do it with, with kind of people present. We wanted to do it actually as like a, quite a live record with people in the studio, and, and we'd do it playing to them, because the kind of the energy you get from people watching you is, is such a strong thing. But then COVID happened. And, was there really a plan to enter a Battle of the Bands competition at one stage? We had this idea that we were going to start a new band, that we were going to start this band Crushed Kid, yep. who were going to be like us at, at kind of 17 again. <laughs> and then we were going to do support slots and kind right. of like tiny little gigs and, and, and yeah, bath, Battle of the Bands and stuff like that. Were you going to disguise yourself and wear tracksuits and, yeah? We, I think we went into all that idea of kind of like having kind of... Um, uh, sort of nom de plumes. And yeah, yeah. Sort of, and, and yeah, it's, it's uniforms a bit fun. and stuff. Now, the idea, I think the idea started as a, actually um, as a way to kind of learn to play the album before we were in the studio. It was almost like a pre-production um, technique because uh, we wanted to sort of simplify everything and learn how to play the songs and all that sort of thing. And then we actually had a couple of gigs booked, didn't we? And, and yeah, then yeah. COVID happened. We had a mm. couple of gigs booked in early 2020, I think March 2020 or something. And then COVID happened, we couldn't do it. So we sort of shelved the idea and then we revived it for last week. We right. played, it, played at the Moth Club mm -hmm. and in Manchester, the Deaf Institute. And they were just kind of riotous. It was they? amazing. Great. I mean, yeah, was, I, mean I think it was like 400 people in all in two gigs. Do you find, I mean, there's a, there's a sort of post-COVID energy at gigs that people are just so delighted to be there, right? Yeah. 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 I yeah. think there's a real sense of community as well. So something I always forget is, I always think, oh, everyone's there to see the band. Do you know what I mean? But it's also, there's a kind of it's ritual. Some, you'd hope. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but there's a kind yeah. of ritual, communal thing to it as well, mm -hmm. I think. I think lots of people just wanted to be in a dark space where they could scream. You know, <laughs> yeah. I think there's, a, there's something really sort of, sort of primal and, and connecting about live music, which people have, have really missed. There's, there's, you know, if you think about sort of things like kind of, you know, in whatever medieval times people congregated in churches and sung together and there's that sense of i don't know there's that sense of the celestial there without wishing to get too profound about it and rock gigs have this, have a different sort of energy but it's the same sort of thing where lots of people are singing together and you get that sense that you're all after the same thing and i'm not quite sure what that thing is but you just want it to you want that kind of connected experience it's, it's transcendental sort of i think it's a yeah. fine way of talking about it yeah yeah that's and right. and you know, and I, I'm very aware of that now. I, I'm very aware that that's almost the most important thing to be to be trying to achieve um, with our gigs. It's sort of like 
it's that connection with the audience and that flow of energy between the audience and the band, and that's the most important thing. And perfection certainly isn't what you're after, <laughs> luckily. <laughs> you know, yeah. and as I get older and deeper into my career, I kind of have less and less time for sort of perf perfection and perfect music. And, and that's why this record, we've made it with all the kind of mistakes left in it and the kind of counts left in it and all that sort of thing. Because I like listening to music that sounds, sounds like it's made by human beings. Mm. And hopefully that's what this is. And human beings are kind of like, are imperfect and they're flawed, but they make quite interesting things. And all my favorite kind of art and music does have a sense of the flawed in it. And I like that. You're uh, back recording with the producer Ed Buller, who re I think was responsible for your first three albums. Tell me what he brings to a Suede album. He just, he knows us, you know, right. I mean, he was there. He saw us before the Drowns came out. He produced yeah. the Drowns, you know what I mean? And we wanted to get back to some of that energy of the very early gigs, the, just the kind of the sheer joy of, of making a racket when you, when you first start out. And he saw us, you know, he saw us when there were 10 people in the room. You know, he, he kind of, he, he knows that vibe. Um, he's kind of brutally honest because he's known us for 30 years. <laughs> he says things that no one else would dare to say. Um, but yeah, he's just, he, he knows us. He's part of the band's DNA, really. Do you find yourself, Brett, writing about different things now you're in your 50s than you would have done in your, in your teens and 20s? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even though this is a rock record, it's certainly not a rock record from the perspective of a sort of 20 year old, mm. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to sort of go back and try and write about the sort of things that I was writing about when I was 25. That would have been pathetic. I wanted to, it's very much a, a rock record, but from the sort of pen of a 54 year old man. And, and, but I was looking for the kind of, the interesting sort of flaws again the flaws and the imperfections of, of 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 being that age and the anxieties and the paranoia and and there's a i think as you get there's a tendency to believe that as people get older they become more comfortable yeah and in one sense they do but in another sense there's kind of like there's anxieties that creep into your life as you get older that can only come from that period of your life and so I write a lot about the, about the fragility of life now, and I write a lot about the fragility of family and the responsibility of that and kind of holding long-term relationships together and stuff like that. These sorts of things that, that induce a different sort of anxiety to the sort of anxieties I had in, in my 20s. I'm always looking for the darkness in, in, in what I'm writing about. I try and keep the darkness out of my real life. So as a father and as a, as a husband, I, I don't bring the darkness in, but I do d deliberately look for it when I'm writing. It's almost a place to put it. Yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. is. I mean, is when you were saying that is is rock about families? That's quite an interesting idea. Is it rock? Is rock about? Well, no, yeah, generally it's not. No, no, no but I mean, the, but do, I mean, making a rock a rock record while you're thinking about families, while you're thinking about aging, all yeah. that kind of because rock it has such a we believe culturally rock is a is such a youthful thing yeah that's, exactly that's yeah. a fascinating process exactly no that's what i mean i think mm. rock is rock tends to be the kind of it's 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 sort of for made by young people for young people sort of thing and for me that's why this record that we've just made wild fiction is quite an interesting record because it's deliberately not there's a there's a real sense of vulnerability that somehow welded onto the kind of punk spirit which i think gives it a kind of a, a duality which i think is quite interesting i mean i can remember when you first said i want to write about family and i want to write about my kids thinking oh god because i mean history is littered with terrible terrible songs about people's families and people's <laughs> kids people generally people get very sentimental about it. It's almost, I think, kind of magical thinking, isn't it? Yeah. If I, if I sing that everything is perfect and I have no worries, then mm. maybe that will happen. Um, but I think it's been, really, it's been really fascinating because all you're doing is you're trying to get at those kind of, those big truths, you know, the kind of love, loss, tension, fear, all these things, but from a different place, you know? And it's, it's interesting that I think lots of people who are much, much younger have really connected with the record because they connect with the emotion rather, th rather than the situation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, what's your, what's your process like when you're in the, in the studio, when you're recording, when you're writing? Do you, do you start with uh, 
Do you start with a theme or do you start with the music or do they, do they blend together? Oh, uh, well, you have a very, very, very sort of broad brushstroke of a theme, you know. Um, but the theme tends to sort of reveal itself as you're writing the album, to be honest. You know, all I knew with, with this record is that I wanted it to be sort of sonically, you know, much sort of harsher and, and less lush and more direct, I suppose. And I, I didn't know that I wanted to, you know, the, the, I didn't know about the nuances of sort of where I wanted to come from. I didn't know that I wanted to reveal vulnerability within that sort of framework. So I think it's that, you know, I never, I, don't, I think it's, it, it's a fool's errand to st stick too slavishly to a plan. I think you've got, to, you've got to have some sort of plan in order to, to, to sort of hang, you know, has a framework to hang things from. But I think if you stick to that too much, then you're just going to kind of like, Mm, it's, it's, you've, you've got to allow the record to deviate from that plan. You've got to allow for chemistry. Haven't yeah. You? That's the thing, there's five of us. So. Yeah. There's no way you can say, right, we're going to do this, 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 and this. Because then the chemistry comes along and you find yourself in some weird, weird place. Yeah. And it's never the same. You always have an, like, kind of an idea of the kind of record you want to make. And, it's, and the record that, that, you, that comes out at the end of it is never <laughs> like that. But that's where the beauty is. It's yeah. sort of like, it's that deviation. That's, that's almost like the kind of. You know, that's the humanity. That's yeah. the, the, you're making. You're you're kind of like failing to 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 achieve what you wanted to achieve, and that's where where the interesting bits come out. Brett, you've talked about regretting parts of your fourth and and fifth album for letting slip the band's popularity while, when when you were really in the in the mainstream. Tell me about what happened there. Were you trying to do something different, or did you just kind of take your eye off the ball? I think think that we became complacent. Right. I think that's what happens when bands become successful. They become entitled and complacent and they don't realize what they're throwing away. And I, I, I think that confused us. And I think there was, a, there was a sort of pressure to sort of reinvent ourselves when we should have just realized what was good about ourselves in the first place. Um, but they're hard lessons to learn, aren't yeah. they? You, know, you have to learn them the hard way. You know, it's, it was, actually, I think spitting out was the best thing that ever happened to us. Yeah, I agree with Because suddenly, when we came back, you have a sense of the fragility of it and kind of the privilege of it. You know, I mean, we have not really done anything else. Yeah. And it's only once you go out into the world, you suddenly realize, oh my God, that was an incredible thing to be spending your time mm -hmm. to. Whereas at the time, it, it was just our lives. You know, okay, Tuesday, it's Belgium. And you just get slightly worn down by it. You know, the, the, the kind of the magic of it disappears. Did you enjoy, both of you, the, uh, I mean, when you were, when you were at your, I guess, your, your earliest peak, uh, you know, when, um, when it was suddenly kicking off, when you were the, the hot young, the, the hot young <laughs> band, um, was that, was that a long time ago. Was yeah. it wonderful, <laughs> assuming you remember, was, was that wonderful or was that terrifying? I mean, it's pretty wonderful. Is it? You know what I mean? Yeah. There, there were moments of terror. Yeah. But, but generally, yeah, it's a fantastic thing to go through. I recommend it to everyone. You know I mean? <laughs> well, yeah. I'll give it a go. I'm, I've very, left it a little late. We've I been think. very lucky in that sense that, you know, to, to, ex, to have experienced that kind of... There, there was a point in about 1992, 1993, where there was a kind of mania about the band. Mm. And not every band gets that. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, as a, as a fan of music and as an obsessive sort of reader of the enemy and, you know, over the years, that's sort of what we always wanted and to suddenly be, be presented that with that was very exciting for a short amount of time uh, but the most exciting thing about it was that there was a lot of hysteria about the band because we were doing something that went against the grain yeah. and that was really interesting I think uh, historically what had happened with the band was when we first started we weren't good enough musicians to ape the genre <laughs> the, the contemporary genre at the time successfully right. enough yeah. so all the other bands that were kind of technically better than us, were able to sound a bit like the Stone Roses. We couldn't sound like the Stone <laughs> Roses because we didn't know how to do it. So we had to kind of go away and learn to sound like Suede. And that took longer. And I always really like bands that you get the sense that the only music they can play is their own music. Yeah. yeah and I get that sense from someone like, someone like the Velvet Underground, right? You can't imagine them sort of like suddenly breaking into a funk. Yeah. Thing. Or someone like the National. I get mm -hmm. that sense from the, about the National as well, that they... They, yeah. they can play one style and that's the national. And it's sort of like suede as well, even though uh, we're, we're musically, it's a little bit more complex than that. 
with with us. It, but we can only do suede. And I, there's I, a suede button that we have to keep pressing. I don't. I don't. I, we're not competent to 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 do to go and sort of do reggae. And thank God for that. I love how many sort of creative people who've done something new do end up actually saying, you know, what we were trying to do, what everyone else did, and we couldn't quite pull it yeah, off. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But what it's, happens it's, is you you make it your humility. own. You sort yeah. of like you make these things your own. And going back to auto fiction, that we've tried to do a punk thing, but it's never going to sound like punk. It's mm. always going to. The, the suede gene yeah, it's a very is suede always album. Of course it the is, suede yeah. gene is always going to sort of emerge. You know, yeah, no, I get or <laughs> to mix my metaphors. When you began back in the nineties, uh, sexual and gender ambiguity was such a big part of your image um, and, and also of your appeal. There was the the album cover for Suede with the two people kissing. Was it a boy? Was it a girl? And all that. Some people found it very challenging and got upset by it, but others found it you know, incredibly appealing, like somebody was finally speaking their language. This was an age pre-equal marriage and so on. How do you look back at that now in the very different sexual and gender environment we find ourselves in? Yeah, I'm proud that we sort of raised those issues at a time when it was kind of terminally unfashionable to mm, raise those issues. Sure. You know, if you look at, look at where yeah. Suede, you know, where, where we sat in the kind of pantheon of British music in the 90s. The, the British music in the 90s was kind of deeply sort of laddish. Very laddish, and, yeah. And kind of borderline misogynistic in lots of ways. And Suede were very much, very much re removed from that and talking about sexual fluidity and all these sorts of things. It, I, and I, in, I, in I think what has kind of turned out to be quite a sort of modern way yeah, I mean, a, a, and, and a I think that's way. interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't kind of bang on about it because I don't want to kind of like claim any kind of. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Sort of like it's kind of parenthood of that of that of that topic. But I think that's interesting to compare it to, it's, to it's, now. It's yeah. fascinating to compare it from now because because now I mean it would you were talking exactly as many bands talk now really, mm. but mm. but doing it you know. No offense, so long ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. You were In the say. mists yeah. of time. I think there was, I mean, there was kind of a virtuous circle there that we, we were talking about these things and it meant that we had an audience. I mean, the, the early suede audience were, were fantastic, like weirdly flamboyant and odd looking people. And you almost get into this kind of virtuous circle where it's almost a space that you can talk about these things. And lots of, lots of the early, you know, suede uh, singles and, and records are about the people around us and the audience yep. around us. And it was almost like a little odd little community, wasn't it, very early mm. on, of, mm. of these people who were kind of drawn together by it. Yeah. You've had uh, two uh, documentaries about the band recently, as well as a classic album, Greatest Hits Tours. Brett, you've done your memoirs. Um, do you enjoy looking back at the past or do you sometimes feel it to be a bit of a millstone, you'd rather people just would focus on what you're doing now? We have a rule that it, for every old thing, we have to do a new thing. Right. No, no, you know, I'm fine with touring coming up if the mm -hmm. next thing we do is a brand new record with, with, with brand new songs. I yeah. don't mind looking back as, as long as you're not just facing that way all the time. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's, 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 there's, a, there's a pull towards kind of nostalgia that I think is the kiss of death. For, yeah, for, for a band, especially a band that's been going 30 years. So every now and then we'll do it. But um, at the moment, especially, it's, it's all forward looking. Really. Yes, I think you can use that nostalgia to inform. You can use the, the kind of lessons you learn from from delving into nostalgia to inform what you do currently artistically as well. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not it's not all kind of like kind of sort of grave robbing. Do you no, know what well, I mean? I mean there, there was an element of nostalgia in your music when you were, when you were 20. Yeah, you know. of course, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, you know, you can sort of look back and lots of, lots of the ret retrospective things that we've done recently, there's, they've something, what, what I suppose what I'm trying to say is that it's all one thing. Yeah. It's not, it, it, it all kind of, they all inform each other. Um, and without looking back you kind of you need to sort of learn the lessons of your history to sort of conduct yourself in the present i think sometimes and, and lots of auto fiction is sort of like is informed by kind of where we went i think one of the things that we ha we have is that the reason that we carry on making new music with such a passion is because we're never satisfied with anything we've done in the past right really yeah it's always a search for perfection 
but a futile search <laughs> for a perfection that doesn't exist. It's like, it's like infinity. Perfection is in like infinity. It's just a concept. You can't ever reach it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how far you travel, you'll never reach perfection. It doesn't matter how, how, many, how, how, many, how long you count for, you'll never reach infinity. It's just this thing you're searching for. And you know that, but it, that, that, that you make that part of your drive to be, to be con constantly searching for perfection. And I look back at th things we've done in the past and I think, that's not good enough. You know, I listen back to old records. I think we could have recorded those much better. They're much, they, 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 they could have sounded much, much harder, much cooler. And so you're always using those lessons to inform what you do now. Yeah. And that's one of the things with autofiction is that I wanted it to be this really kind of brash, ballsy, stark rock record because I think stuff we've recorded in the past hasn't been like that. And I hear stuff on the radio, even things classics like Animal Night Train and stuff like that. I think, Sounds much better live, right? You know, sure. Well, I mean, you, I mean, you've said this, but you basically feel that the live energy, the energy you have as a live band, you've you've struggled to get that on record. Yeah, past. exactly. And yeah. sorry, that's not a, a criticism of production or anything like that. It's more of a kind of an attitude of how of our performance and stuff like that. Yeah, and I and I I, I do think that I think that the band are pretty strong live on, on yeah, a good um, night. You're, you're certainly a much <clears throat> a much rockier band live than yeah. I the first time I saw you. You were, you were a rockier band than I expected. It's a yeah. thrillingly rockier, rockier band than I expected. I love that though. I, I love that, that music, live music exists as a different sort of thing. The point of live music isn't to replicate, it's to, it's to reinterpret, I think, and to, and, to, and to present it in a different way. We've got a gig to do tonight uh, in a weird kind of gig down in Kingston. Uh, my voice is not 100%. And I'll probably have to sort of re-sing the songs and get the crowd to sing them and stuff like that. But the only thing that matters is that you create some sort of energy there. And the reinterpretation of those songs, as long as you do it in a kind of interesting way and with confidence, that will pull you through. It's not about re reproducing the studio sound with perfection because... Because then the you point? might as well stay home. What are your hopes for this album, for autofiction? What does success look like now? I think it's, I mean, it's, it's always the same thing as, as you get older. It's about the songs moving into people's lives, you know what I mean? That they're not just a sound check, that, that, that they mean something to people, that they soundtrack people's lives, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, as you get older, still the biggest thrill for me is when someone comes up and says, oh, you know, we, we got married to the Wild Ones, or, you know, I had my first kiss to your first album, and stuff like that. It's... That's such an amazing feeling, that kind of sense of being a kind of present in other people's lives, of, 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 of touching people and moving people and communicating. I mean, that's, that's what it's for. You know, that's what you make records for, is to, is to move people. So it, it's that, to move a ton of people. Wonderful. Uh, Brett Anderson, Matt Osman, thanks very much indeed. Thank, Thank you so much.